Welcome back to the Stateside Podcast. Today I have a very special guest uh, via video, via the internet in this uh, coronavirus uh, hunker down period that we're all going through. So I'm, I'm super lucky and privileged to have Al, the CEO of URM Academy, on the show today. Um, please give him a good welcome. Thank you for joining the show, Al. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here and uh, I'm glad that despite everything shutting down, we still have internet. Thank God, you know? Oh my God, I know. It's, this whole quarantine thing is, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And I'm sure you haven't or anyone else has either. And yeah, I was talking to my wife about it. Like if things get really shitty and they start shutting down the internet, for whatever reason, the power goes out, you know, if we don't have any water, I, I don't think that would happen, but God, that is a terrifying thought, right? Well, yeah. So definitely there's always the potential for the entire fabric of society to fall apart and this to become a scenario that you see in a disaster movie. I mean, it could happen because there are, I mean, there are failed states in the world. This, it's not like that doesn't happen. Just go right. to the Middle East or the Soviet Union after the wall came down. Like it happens. It's not, and it's not like we're magically immune because we're in the U S like it mm-hmm. could happen here, here too. Though I don't think it's going to happen right now. Not that I'm an expert or anything. I just, I don't think it's going to happen right now. Uh, However, this would be the start of a movie where it did happen for sure. Yeah, it's it's (laughs) literally started. Yeah, it's literally the start of like three post-apocalyptic movies I can think of. Twenty Days Later starts very similar, Mm -hmm. where a an infected chimp gets the rage disease. So they're not actually zombies in that movie. They have a a disease and then outbreak is the same thing. You know, like an animal is infected in a lab bites one of the workers and that outbreak spreads (laughs) contagion, very similar beginning to the movie. It's terrifying. And yeah, yeah, it's just fucking up a lot of things too. I mean, I knew it it would affect our industry and it's already happening in the past 24 hours. We've had, we've had people, you know, pull back from some budgets, uh, deposits can come later than we thought. And I'm sure it's happening for you guys too. It's, it's scary. It's a scary time for a lot of people. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I'm, what I'm about to say is in no way minimizing any of the pain that people are going through because it sucks and it's yeah. scary for everybody. However, uh, I do honestly believe that we're going to get through this. And I also believe that we're going to get a lot of great music out of this time period. Um, I know. And there's, because we're all in this together, like it's a worldwide event. That's why I do believe that we'll get through this. It's not as if one country just failed and the rest of the world went on fine. Like everybody is fucked. It's not just the music industry. It's every single industry except for the hand sanitizer industry. So, I, I think that because of that, there's going to be no room for greed, really. Like, for instance, I got an email from Audi yesterday. I have an Audi. And they said that if I can't pay, they'll work with me. And I believe that all big companies are doing that right now. As long as that keeps happening, you know, as long as everyone basically agrees to freeze time, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to be disastrous. And I'm confident that there's artists right now that we know who are uh, scared and feeling very artisty who are creating music that's gonna that's gonna be very very important um, and historically and culturally so I mean I'm again I'm not trying to minimize what's going on but this is an important time it's a very important time I, I agree. There's no, there's nothing to compare it to. I mean, nine eleven might be the closest thing that I can think of, but that yes, that affected the world, but it affected America more than anyone. Whereas this coronavirus bullshit is affecting the entire planet. 
I mean, that's a crazy yeah. thought, right? Like, I, I, you know, every time I feel anxious or scared or uneasy about this whole thing, kind of cooped up in my house, I think, oh my God, everyone else is doing this too. Like that is a, that's a weird thought. We're all, we're all in it together. And I think there, there is some benefit to that for sure. There's some beauty to it too. Mm -hmm. um, the way that it's like 9-11 is that when 9-11 happened, um, we didn't know we were in World War III, right? Everything just stopped. There's planes falling from the sky, hitting the fucking Pentagon. Like shit is going nuts. Everybody who was traveling gets grounded in some strange city, taking greyhounds from California to New York to get home. Like it's, it was I'm trying to put myself back in those days, but I remember that we had no idea if World War Three was upon us and it was very scary, but also a lot of unity came out of it. You did see the bad parts of human nature, of course. I mean, 9-11 was the ugliest sides of people, but you also saw the best sides of people. But I compare it to 9-11 in the, the aspect that there's um, something that can kill you involved. So it's similar to that. But then I also see it as 2008 because there's all this business instability in the stock market bloodbath. So uh, that's why I posted that status that says 9-11 in 2008 just had a baby um, because that's what it feels like to me. Uh, I feel like it's a combination of both of those. However, I, uh, I feel like, and I could be just some naive hippie for saying this. I really, really do believe that it's going to be all right. I could just be telling myself that, but no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm also a, a naive hippie. I mean, we're all creative type of people, but I'm also relatively analytical. And I think if you look at the data, there should be, there should be absolutely reason for fear. There should be cause of uh, concern for sure, but there's no reason to panic. And there's no reason to think this is even close to in the world. That wouldn't make no sense analytically. I mean, yeah. the, per the percentage of people that could die is appalling, but it's still not everyone. And it's not even a, a close factor to everyone. It's still a minority no. and um, we'll be all right. So, so basically what we're doing is we're going into lockdown to save a million people, basically, at least in the U S yeah. more worldwide. Cause if it plays out naturally, uh, several million people will die, which is still a tiny percentage of the population on earth. Yeah. And I actually have heard people say, just let them die. <laughs> but that's insanity. So that is insanity. We're doing it. it's insanity. So it was like a million Americans could die from this. If you just let it play out, uh, we're, we're taking an economic hit in order to save those lives. It's, yeah. the, it's the right thing to do. And because I do believe that it's okay, I mean, that it's going to be okay. The only thing that we're not aware of is how long it's going to take or what it'll look like on the other side. But that's why I think that if you're stuck with all this downtime, you really should make the best out of it. This should be your time to, uh, to do something great with yourself because what else are you yes. going to do? Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree. Netflix? Yeah. No, no, but you can't do that. that moment. I mean, even just what we're doing right now, this is a great opportunity to, to get to know you, do something productive. We're recording this. We'll publish this. You know, we're, we're being uh, productive with our time and everyone absolutely. can do that. Absolutely. I, I mean, seriously, how many people do you know, who are always saying that there's this one project that they have, uh, but they just don't have the time to do it. Yeah. They just don't, they don't know the skills they need in order to uh, take that project to the next level or whatever. There always some reason for why they can't take that step, but they're too tired when they get home from work to, right. to start that business. I mean, maybe you can't start the business now, but you can, the point is now you have the time to do whatever that thing is. Do yes. that thing. 
for real. Because I mean, shit, man, this could last three months. It could. It could. Hopefully it lasts two weeks, but I know. I know. we could be home for two to three months. So at the end of those two to three months, how do you want to walk out back into the world? Do you want to walk out having Netflix did away or stronger for it and ready to face whatever the world looks like on the other end? Yeah, that's a, here's a good example of that. <clears throat> so I'm recently uh, a new jujitsu practitioner. I've nice. been, been really into it. And, you know, for the past couple of months, I was going three times a week, which for me is a lot. And, you know, I was getting really into it, like kind of addicted to it. I was really loving training and, and learning. And it's, it's such a deep dive into something I've never really done. Three up from zero, right? What's that? Three up from zero. Like, that's right. Yeah, exactly. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. For a chubby, you know, musician type guy. That's, I mean, that's, tough for me to move around like that. And I'm 36 years old, man. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting choked out by 18 year old kids and it's the most, um, embarrassing and humbling thing I've ever done. So anyway, but it's also super rewarding because if you start learning these moves, you're like, Oh, I can do that. That's, it's a superpower. I mean, it really, it's the closest thing to being a, a, uh, like Marvel comic hero that I've ever <laughs> encountered. You really have these superpowers that most of the population doesn't have. Um, so anyway, getting really into it. And then for obvious reasons, my gym had to close, you know, they're, they're at least close to the end of the month. It could be longer, like you said. And in order to keep everyone productive and still engaged in jujitsu and, and moving their body and learning, they released a bunch of videos. They just filmed them over the weekend. And, you know, they put them on their paid website. So anyone that's a member of the gym and that academy has access to these videos. So you can move around at home and even put on your gi, you know, because just moving your gi alone is really hard to do. It takes a lot of practice. And so that's something I've been doing past week. You know, I'm actually still, I'm not training with other people because that's like the worst thing you could do. <laughs> it's, basically <laughs> snug, it's basically snuggling with strangers. You know, it's just the yeah. worst thing you could do during this time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, don't do that. No, it's a Petri dish. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, you know, that's an example of like, if you love doing something and it, whether it's playing in a band, I mean, all these bands that can't get together right now, they should still do what we're doing. Hop on a Skype call, get on a group FaceTime call, whatever, and make some music together. Send files back and forth. You can do that and you can do it now. The fucking yeah. Dropkick Murphys just played their St. Patrick's Day show. Uh, they live streamed to the world last night. And it was just them in the venue, no one in the crowd, but they still streamed it to the world. And I thought I that was Co really cool. Code Orange just did that too. I mean, look, I think that normally these live stream shows are, I, I could be wrong, but typically they're a big fail. Uh, but I think right now, oh yeah, people are fucking home. Do yeah, it. Yeah, totally. Plus, if I, if I was still a musician, man, right now, I would be locked up like practicing six hours a day and writing six hours a day yep. that's been working out one hour and then repeating like that's what i would be doing if i was a producer i was just gonna ask you that yeah well i Since don't we work with producers what what's your what's your tip to, to the producers and mix engineers out there Say that all their work dried up and they're just, they have, quote, nothing to do. What should they so do? So we're talking about pros here, right? Not people yeah. who are. Um, okay, so first, so we're talking about our friends. Or, or both, because people that listen to the show might be up and coming and, you know, they're not quite pros yet. Well, I think it's, it's just different depending on what level you're at. If we're talking about, like, the people you work with and people that I've got on Nail the Mix and everything, uh, yeah. I would urge them to, to not freak out and do whatever they can to get through this in the most productive way possible because it is going to end. And just remember that your clients are working on their next badass record right now. And, right. Uh, and just keep that in mind. Just because they canceled a tour or two doesn't mean that the music industry is over forever. Um, I, I don't think that they should start thinking about changing course or anything like that. So I know some producers who think that the, the end is here. 
but I don't think that's the case. So rather than start a brand new venture, which I see some people doing, I would just take this time to work on, like I said before, take it this time to work on that thing that you don't get a chance to work on because you're in the studio for six weeks straight, 12 hours a day, and you get two days off and then you're on the next record for six weeks straight, 12 hours a day. And I get, I know that there's something that you haven't had the time to work on, whether it's getting that mix of your own project off the ground or uh, learning a, a whole new skill set. Like I know a lot of dudes who are, um, you know, masterful at metal, but personally they'll admit to me that they feel kind of weak with electronics and they always want to get better at it. Why not learn that now? Yeah. Uh, so I would take this as an opportunity to sharpen the saw. Uh, why not? Like I know a lot of dudes want to add orchestration chops to their arrangement mixing abilities. Shit, dude, you're going to be home for two months. Most of your clients canceled. Come out the other end being even more of a badass. That's, that's my suggestion to the pros. And uh, I have a similar suggestion to the up and comers, which is use this time to get better. Yeah. So I honestly do believe that for the most part, if they start getting distracted um, and are like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start a video streaming service or uh, now's the time to start offering a ton of lessons um, when that's not something that they were already all about. I think it's kind of a desperate move yeah. and I understand that these are tough times, but I think it's a distraction. The reason I think so is because this is going to end and we're going to be back to maybe not exactly the way it was a different version, but society is going to resume. Oh, bands for are sure. gonna book, yeah, bands are going to book time again. So why not enter that time period strong, a stronger option for the for potential bands? That's what I think. Yeah, I think if you're there, I, it's just man. I see some producers like trying to start a new business right now. Yeah. it's like, dude, I get it. You're scared, but don't distract yourself with stupid bullshit. Like work on stuff that you've always wanted to work on, but have never had the time. Now you have the time improve yourself. Yeah. It's similar advice I've been giving to the guys I manage. Um, they, they all want to do something. That's for sure. Um, I think what we've been talking about is similar, like stay the course, keep just sharpening that knife, you know, mm -hmm even if you can just pull up some old sessions or write by yourself and then mix those sessions, do that. If you have literally nothing to do, then do that. But luckily my guys are pro enough or they have clients that were, you know, spillover from a few months past. They're still mixing yep. that. So they're still busy. Thank God. But it is a little scary because we don't know how long this is going to continue. Like I've already mentioned, there's been a few artists that have postponed. They haven't backed out, but they're like, of course, we're just, we're just going to pump the brakes for a minute because we're not sure we're supposed to have a band come uh, from the UK, like slated to come in a couple of weeks from now. That's not happening. <laughs> of course. That's just not going to happen. So that'll be pushed back to the summer. But one thing I would suggest people to do is, you know, kind of like we're doing right now, people are at home, you know, you have people's attention right now. So don't come up with anything over the top and off brand to what you do anyway, but you can definitely do that YouTube thing you always wanted to do. Do that live Instagram with that other guy you've always wanted to do that with. Start a podcast or be on a podcast. Do what we're doing right now. Get your name out there. Stay relevant. Stay in people's, you know, view. And and like you said, we'll get through this. Uh, I'll say this, man. Any of your clients, if you want them to come on the URM podcast, uh, I'm ramping up to three times a week during this. Nice. So I need guests. Um, yeah. And I'll, t and I'll, you know, uh, they would, I mean, all of those guys are such big fans of the URM and the whole community. I mean, what you guys have built, not to interrupt you, but what you have built is something that blew me away. When I went to the URM summit back in November, uh, you know, Finn had me come out and yeah, we didn't get a chance to really catch up, but you know, I, I talked to all a few of the other guys and I, <laughs> 
<laughs> Here's one quick dig and then compliment after it. The quick dig is I, th- I thought it would be a fraction of what it was. I thought it was going to be, you know. How's that, how's that a dig? Well, I mean, I, I just, I guess I thought it was smaller than it was. I mm-hmm. thought it was going to be smaller productions, smaller amount of people, a less connected group of people. That sounds and like a sh- compliment to me. Yeah, I mean, it ultimately is. And it is a huge compliment because everyone there was so happy to see each other. There was nothing but positive energy, encouraging energy. Everywhere from a 20-year-old kid who is just learning how to use Pro Tools, literally just beginning, to seasoned veterans like Machine, you know, like the fucking veterans in the biz. And uh, it was great. So anyway, I, I got you off track, but yeah, well, I, we, we would love to be on your show. I appreciate you saying so. Um, and I'm glad that that was your impression of it. One of the things that we've always tried to call ourselves and not just call ourselves, but actually be as an oasis online. Uh, because you go on, it's not just audio groups, but for the purposes of our conversation, audio groups, they're typically super toxic, man. The internet is a rough place. And that's where most people learn these days. They, they don't learn in traditional schools. I honestly, I think most of the traditional recording schools are fucking bullshit anyways, but most people are learning online and you're not going to have a good experience learning this stuff if you're constantly getting humiliated for asking questions and right yeah. <laughs> or just getting spammed relentlessly. You know, there's so much bullshit in these audio groups that oh. makes horrible environment that uh, we've, the, the, community aspect and how it's run is a huge part of how we do things. And it's, it's a priority to us uh, because we want people to not feel scared to ask questions and not feel scared to put themselves out there because that's the only way you're going to move forward. I also want to kind of kill that, that whole idea that, uh, that it's, brutal competition because let's be real it is competitive between producers but you know very well that at the top levels those top producers even though they compete for the same projects they're still buddies and they still help each other out and you know managers who are competing against each other they still are typically buddies and help each other out when it comes down to it like at the higher levels of the actual music industry Yes, of course, some people hate each other. And yes, there's some drama, but a lot of those local squabbles that you see where when someone gets big, everyone tries to tear them down, that doesn't exactly exist. And people tend to be buddies to some degree because that's kind of got to have a lot of friends to survive. And yeah. so trying to get that into, these, into our students' heads is that uh, stop acting like, you, they stop acting the way that you see in these audio forums. Stop acting in the way that your local scene acts. Act the way that you're supposed to act in the music industry, which is a friend to people. Yes. And it's just going to make for a better environment and a better time for everybody, easier to learn, and people will move further because of it. Yeah, it's, it's something that uh, Finn and I have talked about a lot, Qu- quite a few times actually, is the whole notion of people big leaguing you. It's something (laughs) that I'll be honest, when I was younger, it used to really bum me out. Hollywooding. Yeah, dude, when I was in a band and I was reaching out to folks and you know, Hey, would you listen to my band? Would you consider us? Blah, blah, blah. And you'd get those people that just were such fucking assholes or just didn't respond at all or whatever the case. I, I just, it's, it's not that I don't, I don't care anymore. I really don't care. Like if people want to, act that way to other people. That's, that's on them. That's not a good energy to go with. It doesn't win in the end anyway. And so now I just encourage people to, to flock towards that energy that, that you want to see, you know, and and if you want to be friends with people, then treat people like a friend. Don't, don't try to act like something you're not. Don't try to peacock. Don't, (laughs) none of that stuff works. It just doesn't be authentically you and you'll find your crowd. And it's something I noticed in the URM crowd. 
it was a, it was a good group of people that were sincere and honest about what they were trying to do. And that's what I'm trying to do as well. Well, I appreciate you saying so. Um, I, I'm sorry we didn't get more time to talk. I was, uh, I was kind of wrapped up. Right. Oh yeah. The, the event. I mean, again, that's, that's the other part of it. It's like, I also don't assume, you know, someone is busy or someone hasn't responded. There's probably a reason at our age, at our level in what we do now, there's typically a reason. And if it's, if you come to find out, it's just that they're a prick, <laughs> then fuck them anyway. And it, it, no skin off my back. But if it's that they were running a thing or they, they were too busy to respond to you, like, I just assume that everyone, if they are a fraction of busy, as busy as I am, then I know what's going on. <laughs> I know how hard it is to get back to people. So I don't how, take any of that personally. How long did it take for you to come to that understanding? The reason I'm asking is because one of the rookie mistakes I see uh, of people trying to come up in the industry is not knowing, not knowing how to be patient mm -hmm. or persistent at the same mm -hmm. time. It's a tough thing to do because, you know, people say be persistent, but if you're really persistent, you're going to be really annoying and punish people. And then nice yeah. people are the people who would normally be nice to you uh, are going to ignore you. That's right. Whereas on the other hand, if you aren't persistent enough, no one's even going to remember you. I would, I would say it took me a long time and it's still something I, I grapple with now. It's not like I've arrived in this moment, but I, I'm better at it now than ever I've ever been. I think some of it's just experience and age, but I don't know. I think I decided a long time ago that I'm just going to, have you watched the movie, the defiant ones, the documentary, that mm -hmm. mini series? Yes, I have. I'm sure you have people like us have definitely watched that. It's one of my favorite things ever made. And Jimmy Iovine is it's really my, great. Yeah. He's Jimmy Iovine's my guy. He's my hero. And the things that he's done in music, um, I can only hope that if I do 5% of that, I'd be really happy. Anyway, he said something, and I've heard him say it a few times, is all he wants for people is to just put those horse blinders on and just go. Just go. Be you. Go. Go. <laughs> don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. You can, you can lean on friends and get advice. Definitely lean from people that have done this before. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying, especially to the people I manage, don't, you're not going to be so-and-so. You're not because you're you. So double down on your strengths and let's just fucking go. And that's something I decided to do a long time ago with me, the branding, how I manage producers, how I do anything. I don't give a fuck how GPS does it. I don't care how other agencies do it. I'll learn from them. I'll take little tidbits that I like. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing me and I'm doing this thing and people will either be a part of it. And, um, and again, it's, it, it is a balance because you have to be open to criticism. You have to be open to hearing new ideas, right? You don't want to be so locked down and think that you have to figure it out. But at the, yeah. as a creative person and someone's running a business, you have to make decisions quick. You have to go. It's, it's, um, it's, micro speed and macro patience, right? You, you have, put it. <laughs> every day you have to get a lot of shit done, but over time, over months, years, you have to be very patient. If it's not happening yet for you, just keep going, keep, keep doing it. And eventually you'll look back and you're like, holy shit, I never thought I'd get to this place. And that's where I'm at now. It's great. There's this uh, quote that I, I like a lot and I'm probably going to butcher it, but it's that, uh, People always overestimate what they can get done in one year, but underestimate what they can get done in five. Mm. Uh, and when I read that or someone said it to me, I was like, holy shit, that is so true. Because mm. whenever I set like yearly goals, it's always like a crazy amount of shit. And then I, ex I get like 10% of it done. Yeah. But then when I look at the past five years, anytime in like the past 20, I just look five years back. It's like, wow, did a lot of stuff. And so yeah. when I started to realize that I started to adopt more of a long term kind of view and it really helped my patience. Cause I agree. I think patience is fucking key. 
it's that's one of the things I've really tried to develop in myself. Yeah. What's interesting is the older I get, the more patient I get, which is funny because the older you get, the less time you have. But it is funny, right? Yeah. When I was younger and had the most time, I had the least patience. It's weird. Yes. I don't it understand is, it why strange. it works that way. I, 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 the only thing I can come up with, come up with is just experience. You know, we've been scarred and calloused over the years. And I think eventually you just start to find out who you are, you know, and you and just you, don't. You do need to get punched in the mouth by life a few times. I you think. definitely do. I mean, it's the whole Fight Club thing. That's why Fight Club is the best movie ever made. How, do, how much do you know about yourself if you've never been in the fight? And by the way, that's a metaphor. That doesn't just mean physically. I mean, that definitely applies too. Jiu-jitsu will teach you that. But to be punched in the face career-wise and emotionally and, you know, all of those emotions that we go through, you have to go through that. And you don't know anything about yourself until you've hit rock bottom and come back up. That's why I think this is such an interesting time period, actually. Absolutely. I think for, especially for people 28 and under who didn't experience 9-11 or 2008 as either teenagers, you know, above the age of 15. Right. It didn't matter to them. It was something their parents had to deal with. Yeah, exactly. I think if you're you're 17 during 9-11, it would matter to you because, you know, you're almost an adult at that point. I was 18 when 9-11 happened. Yeah. So then you were of definitely of sound mind enough and maturity to understand how fucked of a situation that was. But, uh, but you know that those experiences changed people, uh, some ways for the worse, but overall for the better, I think. I think so. Uh, And I think so. So it's funny, man. So I'm talking, I have employees obviously, and some of them are 35 and some are 23. And the, tr- the ones that are under 28 have a very different attitude towards what's going on. And they're a lot more scared and there's a lot more fear in their voice. And mm. I thought about it and I was like, wait, they've never been through something like this. Not as adults. This is the, their first time that the world, <laughs> the yeah. world situation has punched them in the mouth. That's right. I mean, they've had pretty much, if you're a, 20 anything year old you have had a good economy since you've basically been out of the house yeah you've had no real wars i mean we've been at war but it doesn't feel like it right i mean it's not Not like not like no no not like 2001 no that's right when we were graduating high school i don't know how old you are i'm 36 i was i'm 40 so yeah right around that time you were young 20s right i mean you're a kid Mm -hmm but still sound enough that you knew how fucked up everything was. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, I think the experience is what's making us calmer. I think that applies to business that applies to music that applies to relationships applies to everything. It's why my old man is the calmest, coolest collected guy. I know he's just super chill because he's done it. He's been through it. He's been through some shit, been through some shit. And it's not even like he had a hard life. It was just, he's been through some shit because he's in his sixties. That's how that goes. Man, I don't know if you're experiencing this, but my parents are frustrating the shit out of me in this situation. Uh, Are they not taking it serious? Well, my dad is hard as rocks, basically. He's a Israeli. Just listen to this background and try to imagine him not being hard as rocks. Right. So he was born in a tent. So, okay. So basically we're we're already off. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. His his dad went into the concentration camps with a family. All right. Wife, daughters, I believe he came out without a family and on the walk from wherever in Poland, I believe down to uh, what became Israel. Like they walked that whole way. Yeah. He met my grandmother and uh, my dad popped out in a tent. It took a long time to get down there. Yeah. So uh, already that's kind of a fucked. Yes. Start. Yes. He has um, almost no family. He has his yeah. parents and his, that's it. Maybe and, a couple cousins. Yeah. And his parents are extremely traumatized. Of course. Uh, and then 
they go to Israel and Israel in those first many years is constantly in wars. Yes. It's not like they just went to Israel and everything was fine. Yeah, no, it's not like going now. It's uh, every few years, uh, real armies. It wasn't just terrorist attacks. It was like armies, real war, army versus army, planes, Mm -hmm. tanks. Uh, So he had to serve in those times. Uh, And then after growing up with that, he went around Europe as a starving musician, uh, basic for several years, trying to study from different mentors, like living off of like nothing. Uh, Apparently him and my mom split like two cans of spinach a week when they used to live in Rome. So that in addition to the fact that he's had a successful music industry career for 40 years and, there was even an assassination attempt on his life and oh my God. motherfucker has been through it. So, right. right. And Israelis have this thing, like no one's going to stop us from living our lives. That's right. Never so, again. Yeah. And yeah. And so they're not afraid of terrorists. They're not afraid of getting blown up. They're not no. afraid of shit, which is cool. I love it. But at the same time, you should be afraid of this if you're in the risk uh, in mm-hmm. the high risk group, which he is, he's, How 60, is he? he's 69. Okay. Um, he's in perfect health, but, uh, but getting him shit seriously is hard. And I've seen people posting that the people with parents from 60 and up are having the hardest time getting them to take it seriously. I, me too. I keep hearing it. Uh, my parents are somewhere in between. Um, they are taking it serious. Thank God. But, not as serious as I'd like them to. That's for sure. And I think, I don't know what that is. I think it's part of what we've been talking about is as you get older, you just stop letting things affect you as much. And I think that's, I mean, my mom's reaction to all this, literally when I asked her, she was taking it seriously. She, she, she basically shrugged her shoulders. She went, eh. (laughs) I was like, mom, please, for the love of God. You know, and then she, she made me feel better. She's like, no, we're, we're going home. My dad's going to work and he goes right back home. We don't do anything. He's washing his hands. We're doing everything we can. But I don't know. I think it's just they, especially people like your dad, who's been through so much and his, his family's been through even more. I think eventually you just, you have to decide I'm in control. No matter what happens around me, is, that's going to happen, whether I want it to or not. It's up to me how I respond to things. And there is, some, there is a lot of lessons in that. You know, I, I, I also wish your dad would take you more serious, but there is a, a valuable lesson in that. There you know? is. There is a valuable lesson in that. However, uh, my oh, argument could actually get him sick. <laughs> yeah, my argument is this is going to pass. Yeah. We're not talking about the rest of your life, and we're not talking about, no. like, the possibility of a terror attack, which is very different because <laughs> terrorism is based on causing fear and stopping you from living the way you want to live. Like that's part of, that's the strategy. So in order to defy that, you do go out to eat, you do live a normal life, but this is different, man. It's a fucking illness. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care how rich or poor you are. It doesn't care. Yeah. It doesn't. Here's Alba. Yeah. It, it does not, it does not, The disease does not uh, distinguish. Just Mm -hmm. wait it out. It's not, no one's asking you to give up your freedoms or live with fear. Just wait it out. The end. Well, other than all that stuff, um, let's let's switch gears here because I think people have heard people talk about the coronavirus ad nauseum at this point. Sure. Let's let's give them a little break, shall we? Um, All right. Let's. let's uh, yeah, what's what's a quick uh, background on on you and how you got to the the place that you're at now? Um, wh- <laughs> all depending right. on how far you want to go back. I mean, how, how did yeah. you you know why the URM Academy? Were you a producer and then decided to do that? Like, how did that all go down? Okay, um, I became a producer for the same reason that most people forty and under became producers is because it was too expensive to go to real studios in the early two thousands. And yeah, 
uh, especially in heavy genres, uh, it was very, very hard to find anyone who was any good at recording that. So I remember that lots of bands would go to these super expensive studios and pay way too much money and then come out with a product that sounded like fucking garbage. Right. Uh, they, and they'd go to like a studio that some major label band recorded at and it definitely would not sound like major label stuff. And there wasn't really too much in between. There were no real options. So I decided to learn how to do it to facilitate my own music. Um, and as my band got further, my production career got further. So they both went in parallel uh, and which was by design. I figured if I'm going to learn how to do this, I should learn how to do it right so I can make money off it and then use it to record my own band and record bands that my band is going to partner with, tour with, all that stuff. And it worked. And so band got signed to Roadrunner, uh, Century Media, toured the world, put out three records. And what band? A band called Doth, D-A-A-T-H. That's right. Um, it was started in 2000, ended in 2010, but were signed from 2006 till 2010. Um, gotcha. Did some awesome tours, Japan, Europe, multiple times, Ozfest. So I did the thing. Um, yeah. After that, I went to a studio called Audio Hammer, which is uh, at the time, it's kind of fallen off, but at the time it was like the premier or one of the premier metal studios. And uh, I became one of the, let's say, partners there and worked under Jason Sukoff as his engineer assistant and started doing my own productions even more. I had been producing for about 10 years at that point. Uh, at that time, you will remember that the music industry was in a very fucked up place. Awful. Um, yeah. Right. We People think it's know. bad now. They have no idea. They have no idea. We didn't know if it was going to end in the next two years, like people kept saying five years from now, all these labels are going to be gone. Uh, stuff like that. It was just, that was just the energy floating around. And you couple that with the fact that there was this explosion in home recording uh, and no real information on how to get good at it, especially mm -hmm. back to, especially in heavy music because the traditional recording schools never took recording heavy music seriously. So you could go to Berkeley and learn how to do it, but they right. wouldn't teach you. Metal. No, Full it's jazz. Not. Yeah. So you have this whole generation of people who are essentially <laughs> learning a new brand new technology that hasn't been figured out yet and who are teaching themselves how to do it because no one will teach them. And the mentors who would normally have taught them are either out of business or leaving the industry because a bunch of smart people were jumping ship at that time, like great managers, great producers, like people in bands that were awesome. People were just leaving the music industry. And I started thinking that if it keeps going in this direction, it actually is going to be fucked. And recording quality around that time wasn't even very good. Like there, you can listen to 2010 and it does not sound that great overall. Um, it's not that it's dated. It just, it's like a lower bar than other eras. Um, if you listen to productions now or 1999, you can tell that the bar was higher. Even yeah. though the technology was better in 2010 than 1999, the bar was lower in 2010. And so I'm sitting there thinking, I've been at this for well over a decade. I started playing guitar when I was 13. Like I bet everything on this. This is my expertise. Um, I have, and I have so much expertise in this. This is not the industry I signed up for. This is fucking bullshit. And I need to do something to change it. Uh, so that started floating around in my head. I need to do something to change it. I need to do my part, but I didn't know how. And while I was producing at audio hammer, uh, this voice in the back of my head just kept on 
getting louder and louder. Like you need to do something other than produce bands. Like you're wasting your, your potential. And by the way, I don't mean that to say that producing is a waste of someone's potential. No, but, I, I uh, totally understand. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, I could never have been as good as like Josh Wilbur or something, or like, I don't have it in me to be like a Will Putney or a Josh Wilbur right. or right. one of those guys. I don't think I'm talented enough. Um, and, uh, I think that I have it in me to be right under those guys. And that's not interesting to me. I, I, I have to conquer. And so I accepted that about myself, but that, didn't change the fact that my expertise was in music and audio and this industry is kind of starting to fall apart. I hate the way it's going. And after all these years of just getting nagged by that voice, Finn, our mutual friend, Finn McKenty, who now he's director of operations at URM, uh, you know, him from punk rock MBA on YouTube at that point in time, he was uh, working at a company called Creative Live. Yep. Yeah. What's that? I said, yep, sorry. Okay, so yeah, he was working at Creative Live. And uh, he, um, he and I talked about convincing them to start an audio channel. So we kind of put a pitch together and they agreed. And I was the only producer he knew. So he asked me if I'd come on Creative Live and give a class on a topic that I had never even, I didn't know shit about. It was a program called Easy Drummer. I had never even used Easy Drummer in my life. I was really not into the idea of doing this, but because Finn is a really good friend and was a really good friend, I wanted to help him out. Like I helped him on the pitch. He literally didn't know any other producers. So I was like, fine, I'll do the fucking class. Yeah. Uh, so I learned Easy Drummer in a week and then went and I gave the class. And it was awesome. It was awesome. It was fucking cool uh it was fun it was not lame at all i thought it was gonna be lame and i it was so engaging and people were asking great questions and the fact that i could help them get better i don't know it just it yeah. lit something in me and that from that point on i did like eight more creative lives and each one got bigger and bigger and bigger and there were dudes by that time going on creative live who were way more famous than me as producers. Yeah, one my creative, of my closest my, friends, Chris Kremit went on. Yeah. Yeah. He, like, he's one of them. Yeah. Uh, Kurt Ballou, But, and I say this with all respect, but mine were crushing everybody's in sales. I think probably because I, they were seeing creative live as a cool side thing. Right. I was seeing that as the future. As um, the thing. So, yeah. So I was going for it. Like, I remember some of them would like, cause I was friends with them too, would kind of be like, why are you taking it so seriously? Uh, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I just have to, at a certain point I asked Finn to hire me and he said, no way, not even going to bring it up to them. You and them will not get along. I was like, okay, well then I'm starting something on my own. Right. It, cause if they're not going to hire me, like, I was getting frustrated with how they were running the audio channel. And I was like, I need to run this with you. Yeah. Um, and the answer was no. So it's like, dude, okay, I'm starting something and I don't expect you to quit creative live, but in a few years when it's big enough, I'm going to hire you. <laughs> and, uh, that's what happened. That's, that's, oh, wow. That's where URM comes from. That's so crazy. So, I mean, there's a lot of lessons in there. First of all, you were open to something that wasn't the, the main focus. The main focus at the time was being a producer. But like you said, there's a voice in your head saying, there's something more here. There's something more I should be doing. And so you took it, you know, the leap and you tried Creative Live. You did that and you did it well and you did it better than everyone else to the point where like, I need to be a part of this. And then they said, no, <laughs> that no is the best thing that probably ever happened to you. Cause then you're like, all right, yeah. now I know what I need to do. See ya. And you went and started your own thing. So that's, uh, that wasn't great. even a question. It wasn't even a question. It was like, you're not going to let me on. Okay. I was doing my own thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah no, it's, it was a gift and all, and then how funny Absolutely. is that now Finn is working for URM. 
So that's great. That was always, that was always the goal. I mean, dude, Finn and I had a, had like a, a tone store in like 2014, 13. Oh, really? Called Unstoppable Killing Machine where oh, okay. we did these Kemper tones long before anybody else. We were selling Kemper packs and stuff like that back in 2013. Um, and we called it Unstoppable Killing Machine. And then when I, I was like, hey, I'm going to take that name for this thing I'm doing, but I'm changing it because I'm not calling an educational venture Unstoppable Killing Machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, you'd get a different kind of crowd. Yeah, and especially nowadays. Uh, yeah not good even though i really liked that name but uh but yeah man uh that's cool i know that it sounds it sounds cheesy to say that you want to help people and all that but i honestly wanted to do something that would impact impact music in a way that would raise the bar and whether it's you know whether it goes on to have a wider impact to the entire industry I don't know. I, I don't know. But at least my neck of the woods, I'm helping to raise the bar because I don't want anything to feel like it did in 2010. Uh, yeah. I didn't work my ass off for this expertise to just watch it be wasted on what was going on back then. I think there's so, what you're doing is what a lot of people do. You know, there's a type of person you know, like even at my jujitsu academy, there's people who are world champions there, like professional athletes who compete. And then there's people who are really experienced, high top level black belts, but they competing wasn't really for them. Like they could, they just couldn't do it for whatever reason. They just didn't want to go down that road. And what ended up happening is they found that teaching was more valuable to them and sharing the wealth of knowledge in, in their training. So they go and start schools and, and they get hired as a, a teacher. It's same with music. There's a lot of guys who are really good producers, like very qualified, like you said, just a, a notch below the greats, but you're just like, there's something else. There's something else I wanted to do here. I felt the same way. I drummed in a rock band most of my life. I tried to be in a band, try to get, you know, signed, do the whole thing that all of us did. And it's not to say I don't love drumming and I don't love making music. I do, but I don't love it as much as everyone else. And that started to be very clear to me that like, I like getting in a room and writing music, but I didn't like touring. Not really. I mean, you know, I, I just, yeah, I just don't want to be on the road six months a year, seven months, eight months a year even. And so anyway, I, I just kept finding my own niche and you know, recalibrating, getting to the point where I'm at now. And I think this suits me. This is the best way that I can contribute to music, the music industry so far that I can come up with. And, um, and by the way, me and you both are doing a lot. So you wear the one hat that's like, I'm the CEO of URM. I'm, I'm the guy from Stateside and I manage producers. But we're also both doing podcasts, right? We're engaging in different ways. We have a lot of different things we're trying to do. And uh, I think that's just the modern way. I think there's a lot of lessons for yeah. your, your route, your route to how you got to where you're at now. There's a lot of lessons in there for people listening, no matter how old they are. If they're, if they're, if they're struggling in the thing they're doing, just know that that thing you're doing could lead to something else. And you're not sure what that could be yet. Just say yes. Be good at playing guitar. Because maybe playing guitar isn't the thing you end up doing. But be around that scene. Get to know other people. And maybe it's working a label is the thing where you end up. Or managing bands or managing producers or starting an uh, online service of some kind. Or doing a podcast. Whatever it is, you have, to, you have to say yes. You have to learn a skill set first. And we both did that. So. One thing, though, is that, first of all, you're right. Um, when I was a lot younger, though, somebody said that to me. They were like, maybe you won't be a rock star, but you can have a kick-ass living in music. And I was like, fuck that. I know. Me too. Stop telling me that. Yep. Fucking bullshit. Right. Uh, it would piss me off. Yes. Um, like, I get an fucking angry. Um, because when I was going for 
the band. And when I was trying to be a good guitar player, I was trying to be an awesome guitar player. I, I, I didn't have this, like, maybe I'll do something else thought no. in my head. Um, I did think, though, maybe I'll do something else after. The thing is, though, that it's really important to know yourself and to be honest with yourself. The thing that I think is interesting that you said that I hope everybody listening can develop at some point is that you admitted to yourself that you just don't love making music as much as the other people you know do. And that's yeah. fucking key because yeah. there are people who will live and die for it. That's and, right. That's right. And that's what it, that's what it kind of takes. If you don't feel that way about it, that doesn't mean, doesn't mean that you're not like capable. You're, you're, yeah. You're, you're not a failure. Yeah. And, it's just and, not for you. Yeah. And even if you are, even if you did fail at something, failing needs to be viewed in a different light entirely. I mean, failure at the end of the day, it's really just something that we learn from and, and not to sound corny, but it is the truth. You know, if you tried something and you failed at it, say, say you wanted to be the best sprint runner in the world and you, you went up in the competition, you just failed completely. There's a lot of things to learn from that. You know, how, how do I increase my speed? How do I do better next time? And you keep doing it until you get to a place where you're either going to get better and you're going to continue doing it, or maybe you didn't win the race because you didn't love running. <laughs> That's entirely true. And especially when you're young, we get caught up in this identity. Like, this is who I am. I am a drummer in a rock band. I am nothing else. Fuck off. Don't even suggest other things to me. And it's, it's a catch-22 because like you, you pointed out, when you are in that place, no one can tell you otherwise. And it requires obsession. It requires a focus. Yes, it does. A focused energy, or else you'll never even succeed. So, I mean, I guess again, it goes back to the full circle here of, of patience and age. You have to know that you'll be okay. You have to know that you'll end up in a place that is best for you. But you have to trust your instincts. So, if if it's telling you to be a good guitar player and it's telling you go all in, then do that and do it one hundred and ten percent. Yeah, it's it's funny, man, that you said that maybe you don't love running. I I didn't love guitar, um, not the way that, not the way that like the other guy in my band loved guitar. And him, to this day, is still an incredible guitar player. He just went on tour with Tony McAlpine. He's like, mm -hmm. he was an. I met him when he was eighteen. He was an incredible guitar player when he was eighteen, and he's an incredible guitar player now that he's like thirty eight and. It has not wavered and I never had that. It just, it's an obsession that I had to fabricate. However, I still worked my ass off at it. And because of the work ethic, that's allowed me to do what I'm doing now. So because I worked so hard at guitar, I know what it means to get good at an instrument. I know that instrument inside and out. Uh, because of the band, I know exactly what it's like to be in a band at all levels. Uh, even mm -hmm. though I haven't been in a Slipknot size band, I've been close enough to them and in the same environment that I understand the band journey from start to there. I have connections, you know, I have like 15 years worth of connections at labels and other bands. And then through the managers, agents, people in the industry and then through the production i have the experience of having worked on records from zero all the way to bands in the top 20 and because of all that you put that all together that's how i'm able to have the expertise to do urm yeah. uh, because there's no way that i would have been able to get bands to say yes to nail the mix if i didn't understand how that world worked or had contacts in that world. And so I think as long as whatever you're working at, you are fucking going for it. Like mm -hmm. your life depends on it. Uh, you're going to be good. If you then figure out how to, you know, say it doesn't work out in the end, you can still take that expertise. Um, some part of that expertise and, uh, and transfer it. So Absolutely. the, the key I think is to just not be, half-ass about anything ever. Um, yeah. 
No, I, I, that's 100%. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of any value, valuable reason to half ass anything. Um, because you're, I mean, I'm in the same place. Like all the things I learned in my younger days, playing in bands, being around venues, being in studios, being around producers, having records mixed and paying for things, mostly myself. I never got to a place where my band ever got signed. So I stayed in that unsigned self-funded mode. And as we both know, a lot of bands, especially today in the industry, a lot of bands, great bands even are still self-funded. So you have to know how to talk to people, how to negotiate with bands. And, uh, I think, you know, not to toot my horn, but I think when I'm talking to people and setting up projects, people sense that I come from their world, that I come from, you know, that basement dwelling band guy. <laughs> they yes, know that you I come from that world. That's right. I do. It's very authentic. I don't have to pretend I'm not, you know, pretending to be someone I'm not. Um, and I think that's, you know, cause you, I've seen, I've seen other people try to transition into management, whether it's managing an artist or, or producers, and it doesn't quite work for them because they're trying to be, I don't know, Ari Gold from Entourage or something. They're trying to put on this, like, I'm the suit now. <laughs> I, I, I'm on the other side of the fence. And, and in reality, we're all in it together. Not Again, not to sound corny, but it is the truth. Like, I want the best for the artist we're working with, and I also want the best for the, the producer I manage. Because otherwise, it doesn't... It doesn't serve me or anyone I work with if their release doesn't do well, if the record doesn't come out on time, it doesn't sound incredible, and it's not at a value that everyone can actually afford. Yeah, that, what are you doing it for in that exactly. case? Right. I mean, it's uh, yeah, but I mean, it's appalling to me how many people try this sort of thing and don't have that in mind. They're just trying to squeeze as much money out of people or or whatever it is. So, by the way, uh, speaking of what you were just talking about with people trying to transition into management, but not either either not understanding what the gig's all about or pretending to be something they're not, that's actually kind of what I meant before when we were talking about how to make the most of this time. Mm. And I said, don't, don't like... Don't deviate too much. Don't deviate. Yeah. 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 That's kind of what I meant is uh, yeah. stay the course with who you are. It's really, yes. really important. Don't let panic freak you out into deviating from yourself. Well, especially since this is not forever, like you were saying. Yeah. yeah exactly. I mean, that'd be, it'd be one thing if this was 10 years, we're going to have to live like this for 10 years. Well then, yeah, maybe we've got to figure some shit out, but <laughs> At most, it's going to be a couple months. That's not a long time. It feels like a long time when you're cooped up in your house for a couple months. But in the, the reality of the longevity of your life, that's a blink. That's just a moment. And we'll totally. be out of this before you know it. So I have a question, though, about those Ari Gold types. Um, yeah. There's, I feel like that reminds me of when corporate entities try to try to do something in the music industry by just putting a bunch of money into it and brand branding it in a way that is they think is cool and it, like like well, red bull records or yeah. myspace records there you go something yeah. like that um or uh on the other hand have you ever had have you ever seen those bands that have like a quote unquote investor and oh, yeah. the investor is like some rich guy who, you know, who maybe works at a law firm or something yeah. like that, but he's got money and he's he just wants to feel cool. Yeah, yeah. totally. No, yeah. I, I talk to him every once in a while and they, and they say, well, cause I, I go through the same kind of pre, uh, project questions. I kind of do a quick interview, like give me a quick background. What are you guys trying to achieve as a band? Are you signed? Are you not? What's your budget? Blah, blah. And every once in a while people will answer that with, well, we're not signed, but we have a guy. we got a guy. we got a guy. He, he gives us a bunch of money and I'm like, well, hold on. Let's, let's pump the brakes. Who is this guy? What does he do for you? You know? Red flag. God, that is such a red flag. Yeah. Uh, it, but you know, it's, what I think that has in common with the Red Bull Records situation or, or like, have you ever noticed in a movie 
when there's that part where they go that get around the metalheads or the punks and it's just yeah. like so off from the way these people actually are in real life it's so out of touch i think people smell authenticity in music there's an authenticity that has to be there that if it's not there people are going to just they're going to smell it from a mile away mm-hmm. and whatever you're trying to do is just not going to work yeah it's like, it's like this it's like a, a dog sense almost well especially in art like what are we doing here what are we all a part of here? We're all part of creating art and we all have a different role to play. Mine's managing yours is your M yours is a teaching, passing the knowledge down. And at the end of the day, it's to produce the best art possible. That's it. And that's what we're doing here. And I think if, if you come at any of those angles, any of those uh, involvements in this thing in an unauthentic way, it's not going to work. It just won't. Because people will sniff, like you said, they'll sniff it out. It's just not going to work. So uh, you're best to just be authentically you and speak the truth. So how do people with, uh, with bad social anxiety deal with that statement? Um, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I feel like the people who are like, yeah, but it's me to be a fucking introverted uh, yeah. weirdo never networks. I I'll, um, I'll be honest with you. I, it's not that I don't have empathy for those people. I do. But anytime one of the guys I manage says that, and they do, and you know who you are, we have these conversations, we have these debates. It's probably the only time I argue with any of my guys because there are producers that I work with and there are producers that I don't work with, for example, that say that they say, I didn't get in this to be a a fucking vlogger, man. I don't want to be an Instagrammer, right? Like (laughs) that's not why I got into this. I got into this to to be a mix engineer and produce. And it's like, I get, I get all that. I get it. And I, I didn't get in this to write invoices. That's not, I wanted to do other things too. But the part of the job is that in 2020, part of being a producer is self promotion, getting your name out there and marketing. You're running a business. And if you don't think you are, then you should just quit now. <laughs> you might as well yeah. quit now. It's a business that relies on uh, relationships. That's it. So if you're not willing to forge those, what, what are you doing? What are you also, doing? I don't have much empathy either because uh, I overcame it. And That's I right. know people who overcame it. Yeah. And and look, I I don't take it lightly. I'm, I'm lucky. I, I didn't struggle with that. I mean, I have social anxieties for sure. I get nervous and especially when we first start a pot, I'm always fucking, you know, nervous, but it, that passes. And that's, that's a good lesson. It does pass. You do get over it. And again, if it feels inauthentic to do one thing, find the one thing that is authentic. You know, there's, there's video, there's written word, there's audio, there's a lot of ways to promote yourself. If you don't like holding a camera and doing the vlogger thing for YouTube and Instagram, don't do it, right? Be a photographer, take images and write an interesting caption. Do that. If you don't want to do that, which I don't know why, write a fucking blog. If you don't want to write a blog, start a podcast. There are so many options for you. And luckily there's a few that you can do um, out of those five or whatever I just mentioned. Hopefully there's a few that you can do. I like talking, so I did a podcast, right? I think I don't have the best video face, so I don't do YouTube all day. That's not my thing. So I, I started a podcast. I try to engage on Instagram. Those are the way, and, and like actual phone calls and, and you know building relationships with people the old-fashioned way. Um, that's the way that I chose to network. So, yeah, I mean. I always know. tell people to choose what they'll actually do. Yes, yes. Right. So I think that what you just said about like YouTube or whatever, you know, if you're not comfortable with one type of promotion or networking, pick another. Pick it's another. not like, it's not like there's only one option out there. No. But the point is you got, you have to be connecting with people. Mm-hmm. And if you don't do that part, I mean, I've heard some people say, yeah, but uh, Andy Sneap doesn't do that. It's like, yeah, but, Dude, you're not Andy Sneed. 
You know, and it's neat. And, and yeah. I don't care. And also, no, I don't no care. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, you're, you're doing this, I'm comparing myself to other people game. You're not him. If the fact that you've even brought that up tells me that you're not thinking clearly. Yeah. Because like, Andy Sneap has never once had this conversation. He just chose to not do it or, or whatever the case is. Uh, you don't know their, their background. And, and to be honest, most people that, quote, don't do that or don't have an Instagram account, they come from the 90s. They come from back in the day. They, they had a network of people that they can still rely on and still get constant work without having to hustle themselves on Instagram. Yeah. Good uh, for I them. Mean, it, it reminds me of uh, when I do one-on-ones with people, sometimes we're talking, to, we're talking about people who are at the very beginning of their career. Yeah. One of their biggest issues is that they want to work with bands that are a certain, like, okay, let me, start it over. They want to be able to choose who they work with. Okay. And my response is, you know, that that is like the ultimate goal for all producers is to be able to choose who you work with. That's like, like, I don't like this one. I'll pass. Yeah, yeah, of course. Everyone wants to get there. That's like, Oh, top 1% of the 1% to actually be there. Oh yeah. Uh, Yeah. I, I get that you want that, but it's going to take a while. And that's how I feel about the promotion thing is like, I get that you don't want to do it. And there are some producers who don't have to, but Mm -hmm. you should look at that as your goal, not as the way you're going to behave now. Because if you're at the point where you need to promote, then you need to promote. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think back to, what you just said about, you know, them wanting to get to a place where they can choose the, the type of bands I want to work with. They, you'd be surprised the level of people that it seems like they're doing well. Like they're a professional working producer. You'd be surprised at how much bullshit they have to take. You'd be, you'd, you'd be shocked. I'm talking to the audience, not you. No, I know. You know, and it's like, so that's one thing. And also, the, you know, a few of the guys I manage are very, uh, their eyes are open on that. They're thinking clearly. They know that, that this is a service. It's like, uh, not to dumb it down, but this is a skill set, like being a plumber or being a, a welder. <laughs> like, this is a trade at the end of the day that people are paying you money to do. So it's not, it's not necessarily your place to decide if this band is good or not, in your opinion. I don't even know what that means anymore. I re- the older I get, the less I even know what that means. There's things that I don't like, but I can't objectively say it's not a good band. Like Justin Bieber's not for me, but he's obviously for a lot of people in a, yeah. in a huge way. So that elitist like punk rock mentality has got to go the way of the dodo if you want to be a successful anything in this industry, any relation to this. You have to let that go be a professional, give people value, make the thing that you got in your hands the best that you can. And that's all you can do. That makes me think um, of a question I have for you. Yeah. Which is what role do you think an, a producer manager has in your mind? And at what point does someone or should someone start thinking about getting management? Yeah, it's a valid question that I get asked a lot. I, I think the role of a producer is different for everyone. I don't think there's a copy and paste thing for every guy. Or every guy. But, I'm, but I mean a producer manager. Yeah, yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Okay. The, the service that some like me can provide, there are a few things that stay consistent. Um, project management in general, it, the administrative portion of what you do. Um, being able to, to sell... It's, it's easier for me to talk about how cool you are than for you to talk about how cool you are. Now, this does come into play that even if you have a manager, you still have to be able to sell yourself. That, that'll never go away. Um, but the high, and also the higher caliber you get, if you don't have someone talking about rates for you, it's not going to go that well. Um, one of my guys is lucky enough to do more big label stuff, you know, uh, bonkers kind of rates that if, if I were, it's like, a it's like if you go to a car dealership and you know those rich guys that really want to buy that really nice Porsche, they almost get offended if you 
give them a price point that's not super high because that's why they're there. They're mm-hmm. there to they're there to to show off. And uh, big labels or this this pop rap hip hop kind of scene, especially they they want to talk those numbers. They want you to throw out two thousand per mix. They want that. And if you don't even come at that from that level, then you're not going to get the gig. Unfortunately, um, that's been in my experience at least. And I think that as as far as when someone should get a producer manager, you should be at a place that you're having a tough time responding to emails. You're having a tough time booking incoming gigs. You're having a tough time with the bigger picture. You know, like, where am I going? Am I just doing the rat race? Am I just taking more mixes? Or do I have a chance to breathe and, and come up from a bird's eye view and look back down on my career and think, okay, where do I want to be the next five, 10 years? If you can do that, then that's a time to get a manager. The time to not get a manager is when you're trying to grow your career or or start your career rather. Uh, That's not the time. The time to not get a manager is because you're having trouble booking more work. That's not what a manager does. They're not a booking. Thank you. (laughs) No, that's, that's not, that's a misconception. I get hit up multiple times a day from people starting out and it's no knock on them. They just think that there's some guy out there that can hit the magic, (laughs) that can hit the magic music industry button and, and just produce a bunch of work for them. Man, uh, don't, wouldn't that be nice? (laughs) Wouldn't that be nice if, if I could hit that button? Fuck yeah, I would. Here, you work with Katy Perry. You work with Justin Bieber. Here you go. Money for everyone. Can you get me Slipknot? Yeah, it's Slipknot for it for IL. There you go. Slipknot for everybody. For everyone. That'd be great. But that doesn't happen. I have yet to meet that big industry RE Gold type that can do that for everyone. And if you, and if you do meet them, go get them. I encourage you to have, have that guy manage you. Um, <laughs> you know, but I'm what... I'm thinking about how unrealistic that is. It's so unrealistic. So, I mean, it's, there's not a quick answer to what a producer manager should do and when you should get one. but You know, it's really like, where are we going? Uh, Who should we touch back with? Whether it's a label, who should we keep in contact with? You know, the managers of bands, bands themselves. I have a shitload of reminders. I use a customer relations software that, you know, everyone's projects are pending and what point they're at and have received the deposit, who owes what, Mm -hmm. through what payment service, all that stuff I do for them so that they can focus on the craft. They can focus on producing. They can focus on being present with the artist in that moment. So they don't have to go, oh, hold on, let me respond to this email and negotiate my rate real quick. Um, so yeah, th- that's, that's the people I manage are people that are uh, hopefully working enough that they, they need help. So they've already got their own momentum, which it, is not, that's yes. To, to be honest with you, and this kind of... Uh, it, it almost talks me out of my job, but I don't care because this is the truth. People, the, the guys I manage should be fine with or without me. Well, In yeah. The, they should be totally fine. The, the day-to-day stuff would take adjustment, but in the end, they should have their own client base. They should have their own brand. They should have their own self-reliance that someone like me should be able to come and go and they're going to be fine. I don't think that you're talking yourself out of a job because I think that there's a lot of benefits to having a manager, but I think that, you know how they say that don't go to a label, let the labels come to you Mm -hmm. or labels want your band when you don't need them anymore. Yes. Yet bands still sign the labels. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Because they could, you know, like the, I, that's how I got signed to Roadrunner was I understood how that works. And so right. then I created a situation that I knew would be attractive to them. You, re- you uh, reverse engineered what they yeah. wanted. Yes. Right. And so I know how that whole thing works, but I also know that regardless of that being true, uh, bands still sign the labels and people still get managers because yep. while you could do everything yourself, uh, sometimes... You shouldn't do everything yourself. That's right. Shouldn't not. It's I can't. It's not a, or can't. But but you just said that they could if they wanted if they needed to. But yes. I think that uh, that 
So any CEO or something, and I'm using that comparison because a producer is the boss. Uh, any CEO has advisors, has oh, director of operations. Oh yeah. oh yeah. There's a whole team that they work with. No there one's are, doing it alone. Yeah. There are people who are handling things that are administrative. There are people who are giving them feedback. There are, it's not just like the king on top of the mountain who just issues edicts and, right. uh, and then the, you know, the minions march. That's not how that shit works. In, in the music industry, when you're a producer, uh, you are kind of in charge of way more than just the music, way more. Way you're more. in charge of relationships between the band members. You're in charge of a relationship with the label. Yes. You're in charge of project management. Then you're in charge of your own team. You're in charge of a business. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Accounting, and, taxes. Yep. How much money am I putting aside? All of those things are real. So do you want to do that all on your own? Because I guess technically you could. Yeah. And, but, and by uh, the way, this is also something I, I need to point out. Not even producers that qualify to get a manager shouldn't always. There's, a, there's a, only a percentage of people that I think even qualify to, it's, I say it all the time, but you have to be manageable to get a manager. <laughs> well, it, yeah, that too. That too. And, and not all artists should have a manager. If you're someone that is just like type A to the fullest degree and you just don't want anyone else's shit in your shit, then don't ever get a manager. That's me. It's just, then yeah, exactly. That's right. And I think you know that about yourself and you're like, fuck it. I'm just going to do know, this. I know it now. You know it now. Right. And I, I think that that's important to know. I think someone like uh, Jay Moss is a good example. He of someone that likes a team. He has a lot of people that are part of what he does, you know, from mix assistants to even his wife. I mean, him and his wife are like co business owners together in many capacities. And he's got a lot of people that are part of the Jay Moss recording team. And I just happen to be one of those team members, you know? And I think that that works for him. He's a, he's a people guy. He likes like, okay, this is happening. What do we think about this? Here's my opinion. You're, you know, and I think, bouncing ideas off someone uh if you're that type of person that's that, i mean that's that's half of what i do with all all those guys we just hop on the phone call and we talk you know we, we chit chat about what we're doing and um i give them my take they give them they give me their take but if you're someone that just wants to be insulated and do it all yourself then a manager is not for you in any capacity not just as a producer it's not exactly that with me but i, I agree with you um it just no, it's not like that for you because you have it, a team for URM. Yeah, it just I have the thing is, which is interesting because it kind of fucked up my relationship with managers for a while because I hated them for a moment, and now yeah. a lot of my friends are managers because I, I then I realized at one point that I'm just unmanageable. That's what was going on. Like right. I, I have to be in charge of right. this stuff and. Um, I am not, I am not capable of, of splitting that. And I know that a manager is technically working for you, but they are given some authority. Uh, there's, there's a level of authority there, especially with a band manager. Um, and that wasn't, I always felt like I, I don't know, man, it's just the conqueror in me can't handle that but yeah and that's good to know yeah. about yourself yeah. right because it, it know yourself that's boring. yes yes absolutely and look there's enough to go around when people like you say that to me i don't think oh no oh no there's no one else to manage no i think of course, of course i think there's plenty cool. there's plenty <laughs> there's too many you know i can't take on the amount of people i would like to because it's too too much it's too much and um I think in the end, I think it, everyone's different because, you know, you go to big agencies where there's multiple manager, managers and you get sort of assigned a guy, like a, a, like a multiple agency, mm -hmm. manager agency. And that's different. That's real day-to-day -day project management only. You don't really have that same relationship with someone. I'm a small thing. It's just me. My wife helps with some stuff, but it's really just me. I'll get an intern soon. But 
for me, it's really like a business partner. That's, that's how I see it. And that's, I think how all the guys I work with see it. It's not so much that I just manage them. We're partners. So anything that they're working on, um, I'm a part of, right. And to, to the, to the degree that it makes sense, I'm not a part of, uh, someone's real estate business, right? <laughs> I'm not a part of someone's side hustle. If they, if they work as a carpenter two days a week, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I, but anything that makes sense and can, I can bring the value and they can bring the value because it goes both ways. I don't want to be part of anything. If you can't show me value, I don't want to manage you. There's no point. Um, so it goes both ways. So anyway, if you are someone looking for a producer manager, just ask yourself all those questions. Am I, am I someone that needs project management? Am I someone that wants someone to negotiate the money part for me? Cause that's a lot of what a manager should do for you. Mm-hmm. Um, am I someone that wants someone in the background networking and going to NAM and going to the URM summit and, and talking to people online on the phone? on my behalf. If you can trust someone to do that and you can find someone that you trust to do that, then go for it. But what you shouldn't do is you shouldn't graduate full sale and, <laughs> and then go get a manager. You gotta, you gotta pay your dues. <laughs> you gotta pay your dues for a long fucking time and you gotta do free test mixes. You gotta hustle your ass and build a community of people that want to work with you. Then go get a manager. I think also, and this has to be said that you're going to attract a manager that's correct for the level you're at. Yes. So managers don't, they don't raise your level. What they do is they help you operate better and take care of things so that you can then ascend on your normal, on your career trajectory. So if you think that the manager is going to ascend you, you're wrong. Uh, And so, what's actually going to happen is if like, for instance, you're a local band with no prospects for anything, the only manager that's going to want to work with you is someone who also has no prospects for anything. And you're not going to get somebody who is getting their bands on big ass tours. Why? why, Why, That makes no sense. Yeah, I I had a kid ask me from a band and I'll, I'll be vague because you you, you don't even know. Anyway, some guy in a band uh, a long time ago had asked me because I had some connection to someone that manages every time I die. We'll say it that way. And he asked me about that connection and how he and his band can get in contact with those people. And I'm like, no, (laughs) A, there's no way I would do that. And B, have you even played in front of anyone more than 20 people at a time? He's like, no. Like, well, then why, why should that matter? Why, why should, why should matter? Yeah. And the answer is because I love my band. I really want this. I, this is all I think about. I'm me. so dedicated. Me. And it's all about them. And it, and it goes for producers too, by the way, because I think I'm good at this. I think I can do this. That's why I think I should have a huge audience, a huge <laughs> network of people that want to work with me. And it makes no goddamn sense. If, if, if you don't have a market, then there's nothing to release it to. If you don't have a market to play in front of, no booking agent would even consider you to be part of a circuit, someone like Every Time I Die, who paid their dues for so long <laughs> before they even had any help. I mean, that band is, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, can we talk about delusion for a second? Yeah, we can talk about delusion. Because that's what we're talking about. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to find a document here that uh, I'm I'm searching through my texts, a document that I want to read on air. Okay, please, <laughs> so, can't wait. So basically, so we we're talking about how people that hit you up and are like me, 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 me. Mm-hmm. The producers do it too. Yes. Uh, how not to approach somebody? I'm going to find this document. I'm going to read it. But basically. One thing that I have noticed, because I get hit up by people all the time asking for a job, yeah. is uh, and a lot of people still think that I produce records. So they want to intern for me in the studio, uh, which is really dumb because <laughs> you should always 
study who you're hitting up, right? Yeah. Why would you hit somebody up without knowing who they are and what they do and what they're up to? That's right. If you're hitting me up and asking to intern for me in the studio. You're already way off. Dude, I, I, the last record I did was in 2014. Ugh. Like, Ugh. It, immediately, I know that you're not paying attention uh, and you're delusional. But it, the, the delusion, too, is in that people think that they matter a lot more than they do. And so if they say to you, me, because uh, I care, because I'm passionate about it, that means you should be passionate about yeah. it, too. Yeah. Which is, again, a delusional way to think about it because we all know that no one gives a fuck. No and uh, about you me, to, about you, about anyone. Yeah, you have to think about what you're what you're going to bring to somebody else. Okay, here it is. Yes. Uh, this is not a job offer, but it was. Uh, we do one on ones at URM, mm -hmm. uh, where we give like twenty minutes of like career advice or mixing, yeah. crit, or whatever. That's great. Okay, um, and we ask them to fill out a form. And this one, so is, the question is, what are you hoping to get out of this one-on-one? -on -one? Here's what it says. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm deep in my local metal scene. Everyone knows who I am and who my bands are. Word of mouth and local networking is pretty easy for me. Oh boy. The bigger picture outside of my local circle, I need to know how to find and approach management companies to try to gain access to bigger bands, labels, etc. I need everything down to the subject line of an email to set alarms off that I'm a boss and my email should be opened and read immediately. You know, the online dating of business. I am new to the audio scene, but I tend to attack things pretty aggressively and want to have my ducks in a row. Yeah, there's, a, there's so much to unpack there. <laughs> that, that's just... It's a good one. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so, it's as though you wrote that. It's rich. So like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's literally everything you shouldn't do. Yeah. And by the way, I want to point out because I see a lot of people quote at our level, whatever that means, any success at all that, that shit on up and coming people. And I, I don't like it. So I, I don't want to ever come across that way. What we're doing though to say that you don't matter and we're saying you're thinking delusionally, I'm not insulting you. At least I hope I'm not. What I'm saying is you have to re that's actually a, it's a gift that we're saying this. It's a gift. Take yes. it. Take it. It's a, it's a crumb of knowledge that you can use to your advantage. If you are a band that doesn't have an audience and now you hear that, you hear it back to you. You're like, you're not ready for management. You're not even close. Then hear that and now reverse engineer how to get to where you want to get. It's not by contacting people that are already there. No, now go build an audience. <laughs> how do you build an audience? Well, there's a lot of ways, but uh, by trying to skip all the steps and get to the end is not the way you do it, ever. Yeah, so I'm not trying to belittle anybody. I'm more no, trying to make light of that this is what happens when you send emails like this, like yes. nothing. And people are like, what? <laughs> and then they send yeah. it to each other and are like, dude, this is, check this out. It's funny. But yeah. It, well, and also like, I mean, again, like a, a 19 year old person who's quite literally learning how to use Pro Tools to, to reach out to someone like me to ask for management is so far off. We're, we're already so far off the track at this point that you need to get back on a track. You need to even get back on you, it's again, you should, uh, you should know when the right time to get a manager is. You should know. And if you don't, then you're not even, you're not even close. And, and it's, there's nothing wrong with asking. There's nothing wrong with like, Hey, this, you know, spell it out. This is where I'm at in my career. These are the places I'm at. These are some kind of things I'm trying to get. Um, and, and then at, some, sometimes people have the, um, the, I don't know the courage to ask, am I even close? Like, is this something we should do? Like, are you someone that could help me? That's okay to ask. There's nothing wrong with asking that, but to send an email like the one you just read where you're like, here are the things I need <laughs> because <laughs> I want to come across like a boss and I want to do it. It's just so full of ego and, and delusional really. 
So yeah, I think so. If a nine, I guarantee that if a nineteen-year-old who just got Pro Tools hits you up and says, "I'm brand new at this, but I really want to make this my career," uh, not asking you to take me on, but I'm just wondering, do you, how did the guys that you manage get really awesome, or mm-hmm. uh, at what point do you think I? might be ready for a manager you probably would respond and and, and i do yeah i do all the time because that's that's some that's a right thing to do i don't mind those messages that's that's a good message to send because totally. then i will follow up i'll say well here's what these, these guys did here's what we're looking for you know here are some tips on on how to grow instead of you know them saying i really want a manager tell me how to get there that's a different entirely different message and by the way, I, I do want to point out some of the people, because like you said, you know, you're going to get a manager that matches your level. When I first started this thing, I literally just started it. I made a website. I had no real experience doing it. And I started with people I knew. I started with friends, people that um, were more approachable for the level I was at. That's not a knock on them. It's a knock on me more than anything. Is it even a knock? No. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm overly sensitive about that, but I don't want to ever come across like I'm dogging on people because I, I hated when people did that to me. Um, it's really just like you have to match the level you're at. And so some people that I worked with and even work with now, it's more of a development thing. They're maybe not so busy, but we're, we're trying to get to a place where they are, but I'm not, I'm not, I think I've earned my place now, I guess is what I'm saying, that I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to develop someone because I don't have to. I'm very lucky that other people are hitting me up that have a more established career and they are doing something because I paid my fucking dues. I've been doing this for at least a few years now and the fucking 28 years of being in a band prior to that. So yeah, it, it just goes back to like, if you, if you feel like you haven't worked your, you know, it's like coming home from work and you, you feel like you didn't put in a hard day's work. If you feel like that, then you didn't work very hard. But if you, you rest, yeah. you put your boots down at the end of the day and you're tired and you're like, I did my job for the day. Then I don't know. I have a Southern accent, but it's just <laughs> a, cow, a cowboy in my mind. If you do feel like that, you'll know when you worked your ass off and your career is no different. If you're reaching out to folks and you're like, I, I think I'm almost there. I feel like I'm doing everything, but I'm just trying to clarify some things. Am I even close? That's okay to do. But you shouldn't be reaching out to people like AL asking for <laughs> all the, the, the <laughs> talking points for the perfect email to send to someone. That's, that's insane. It's fucking craziness. And the, the thing is, I will help people out if they ask <laughs> the right way, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, repulsed by people hitting me up like that it's like because i feel like uh they're not even seeing me like a human being they're seeing me like a an like some sort of a yeah opportunity or object that they can just extract things from yeah but it's weird because i know they're coming to me for help but uh and i don't know how to say this other than getting objectified which is not I don't want it to sound bad in I know you, that we normally think of it, but there's initially getting hit up like that means that you're starting at a point of no respect. Um, if someone reached out to you and said, Hey, I, I just respect everything you're doing. You, you're at a place that I would like to get to one day. Um, you know, I, I just think what you're doing is super cool. I, you know, I, I want to get to know people like you. That's a different message. Maybe it's a little like, uh, I don't know if I have time for that, but that's a different message. When people say that to me, I'm more willing to respond, more likely to respond. And but nobody, yeah. nobody is required to respond to anybody. Right. So no. even if somebody sends something worded correctly, we don't have to respond. And sometimes we are too busy, but if, so, if someone asks the right questions and has a good attitude, Mm-hmm. I am much more likely to help them out. And I know plenty of people who feel the same way. Uh, and I actually know quite a few people who have their career now because they did send an email and mm-hmm. the person saw something in the email and somehow 
gave him a shot eventually. So yeah, and also I've seen it work. And also, I I I, I can speak for myself. I remember having questions and trepidations about starting my business, starting stateside. And I remember talking to my father-in-law about that. And I was like, who the fuck, who am I? <laughs> who do I think I am? What, am? what am I doing here? And he, he, he's a Louisiana guy. He's like, James, all I can say is here I am with Southern accent again. He's like, James, all I can say is all those businesses out there are ran by people. And you're a person, right? I go, yeah, I guess I am, Don. I am a person. He's like, that's all it is. And it was just so simple and basic. And it gave me, it gave me the courage to at least try. And I think that that's a strong message for people out there that feel like, like, who the fuck do I think I am? What am, what am I doing here? Trying to be a producer, trying to be a rock star. Delusions of grandeur, right? And as long as you, you know that you have every right to be here as everyone else, Everyone at the URM Summit had every right to be in that room as the next guy next to him. Totally. Everyone at NAM had a right to be there. And I'm sitting here chatting with the biggest producers on the planet or the biggest product makers on the planet. And I felt welcome. And it only got to, it only got to a place where I started to feel welcome and comfortable in those settings when I had better intentions. And let me clarify that. Like, instead of going up to someone and talking to them because I wanted something from them, like you were saying, instead of extracting something from this person who has whatever, I, I made a, a clear objective to just be friends with them, just to go meet them, hang out, crack a couple jokes. Maybe that turned into a cup of coffee or a beer later. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, then those things that you wanted to extract in that more darker place inside you do start happening. And that's just, that's been my experience so far. At their own pace. At their own pace. And your own pace. That's the other thing. You're not, you're not as ready to receive that extraction as you think you are. If, if you were just to go and squeeze AL for all that info that he has, you better be ready for that wealth of knowledge to come. Because it's not going to come in the way that you like. And it's going to come with a lot more reality and a lot more truth. So, yeah. I, <laughs> that is, <laughs> I've been accused of that. <laughs> But I mean, I just the little I know from you, I know that that's that's the case. You're going to say it the way it is, the truth, the reality. You come from a family of of real experience and no bullshit. And uh, Finn Finn tends to be like that too. Like he speaks very clear and honest with me. Well, you know what his dad does, right? Uh, yeah, he's like a correctional officer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. surprise. Yeah, surprise. You know exactly. He's also a blue belt in jujitsu. He's a he's a killer. Yep. By the way. Don't let that guy fool you. He could choke the shit out of you. Oh, I'm not but, fooled. Yeah. At most people you meet, he could probably beat up. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. I mean, like Finn's a good example. I reached out to him to be on a podcast and I did it in a friendly way. I was like super casual. I just want to chat with you. And because we got to know each other, some more things have de- developed because of that, more kind of businessy relationship stuff. Um, and that's, you know, I can think of a, a hundred, 200 people that are like that, where I decided I'm just going to meet these people. And by the way, that's the benefit of a podcast. It's a huge, sure is. huge benefit. Reach out to someone that you want to get to know that you might one day want to work with and ask them to be on your podcast for an hour or two. You'd be surprised how many people say yes. Because most people want to talk about themselves. Most people want to share their story. And they also have a need to promote. That's part of running a business in 2020. You got to promote your thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. And so starting your own thing and owning that, like giving value, like, hey, I'm starting a podcast. Even if it's not a big show, if two people listen to it, it's still better than the old school, like, I'd like to buy you a cup of coffee or I'd like to buy you lunch. <laughs> No one wants to do that with some guy they don't know. That's, that's, that's not reasonable. <laughs> you want to know something funny, man? Uh, yeah. How true that is. Uh, so the whole, let me buy you a cup of coffee, I feel like is something that um, it probably comes from one of those like Dale Carnegie books, like how to win friends kind of things. Like, yeah. like hit up somebody important and offer to buy them something. So, or whatever, uh, offer to buy them coffee can I just have 30 minutes of your time or whatever? Right, right, that right. never 
has worked with me. And there are people who have tried that several times. Me too. And then after trying that several times, like on the fifth time, they invited me on their podcast and I said, yes. Yes. And what's the lesson there? That's actual value. I, yeah. I can buy my own goddamn cup of coffee. I have enough friends. I, and I also don't have any time. So 30 minutes for me to get outside and meet some guy I don't know, for, that's, that's fucking crazy. It that's is. a crazy assumption. It's it really is. That's it is delusional. delusional. And especially with people that are really busy. That's a crazy assumption. But what's not crazy is like, keep it industry, keep it focused on what we're doing, which is media, production, making content, putting something out to the world. And now you're showing some value. And again, even if you're a new show, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, day one, people were saying yes to me. This is the, a tiny show. It doesn't matter. People still say yes because they, they want to share. I have a, even if I have a small audience, it might be an audience that's not your audience. So now people that follow me and know me are going to know more about you and vice versa. This Beautiful is, thing. You're early in your episodes, right? So it would appear that way in my RSS feed because I, I have another podcast called Nonversation Station and that feed, I need to get all the old episodes back to this feed, but Essentially, if you go to Nonversation Station, that feed has all the old stateside podcast episodes. There's like uh, 80, okay. 80, 90 of them on there. Oh, okay. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, I know. It's, I, I need to do a better job of transferring those back over. I just haven't done it. But we had to change. So basically, long story short, it was called the Stateside Podcast. And the objective was to be like industry music-based podcast. And, mm-hmm. very, and I had a co-host and even over time, a couple co-hosts. And that became very uh, boring. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> Been there, done that for a few guys to get together. And, spe- you know, I, I was doing it with a guy that worked at Rise Records. Um, and so we're like talking about music and working mu- music all day. The last thing we want to do is talk to a producer. So we quickly realized that we just wanted to make fart jokes and inappropriate, <laughs> not very um, uh, PC kind of culture stuff. And to, rebrand that because I didn't want my business name being associated with the worst things that I say ever. <laughs> so You're not trying to get canceled. Yeah, kind of. So I, so I switched the name back to, you know, the state side podcast is just me and a guest and it's music, primarily business entertainment uh, type of people, people doing stuff. And it's not to say we can't talk about some shit, but the other one is quite literally about fart jokes and the worst mm-hmm. stuff. So it makes sense. So that's the story with that. But yeah, I do need to get those old episodes over here because those are all um, people with bands. Like Finn was on that old RSS feed a few times. Okay. Well, I just saw, I just saw like, I was, I saw a post that you had a podcast and was like, "Hmm." yeah, see if he wants me on there. Yeah. And and, um, I'm a lesson of what not to do. Mine's very inconsistent. And uh, I wasn't releasing on the same day that it got confusing with the name changes. All of that is just a, a fucking train wreck. But yeah. you know what, though, man, uh, let me just say, you're saying that's a lesson what not to do. Same here. Uh, we used to have a different name uh, released on different days. I like, mm-hmm. uh, have taken a couple months off at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still number one in its in its space uh, for like audio production. I think, I think that that stuff matters, but what really matters is if people like your content. Yes. Yes. At the end of the day, people come back, even if you take some time off. And my big thing with everything, whether it's starting a business, starting a band, doing that new idea you had, whatever it is, starting a podcast, instead of overthinking it to death to the point where you'll never actually do it, just start, just fucking start. It's not going to be as good as you think it is. It's going to take some tweaking and editing and, and, uh, you know, shaping it into the diamond that you one day hope it'll be. But so it's like lessons for me of what not to do. You can see what I did wrong, but the lessons of what to do is to actually start it. And I, at least I started it, at least I'm doing it, you know, and I'll, I'll figure it out as we go. I mean, it sounds like that's your overall plan of attack in life is just start. It's the Nike slogan. Just do it. It's the best marketing slogan of all time. And it I, is. I believe in it wholeheartedly. That doesn't mean don't attempt to put out a professional product and do the best you can. That's not what I'm saying. But you will never be as ready as you think you will in your ego and your mind 
the perfect camera, the perfect lighting, the perfect microphone, the perfect guest, the perfect everything. And, and if you wait for that day to come, you'll never put the thing out. I bet you Rogan doesn't even feel like he's got that. No. He should. By the way, he's got the most open format show ever. There's no yes. editing. It's three hours fucking long. And it's about nothing. <laughs> they just, yeah. he didn't, never has anything prepped. He doesn't have questions. Uh, sometimes he barely even knows about the guests he's talking to. And I think in a world where we grew up with inauthentic people on media, news anchors, and this is so-and-so from ABC. <laughs> well, but it's like, no one talks like that. That is a weird robotic way to speak. And so when podcasting came out, especially with people like him early on, I think we all responded well to that. But that was a gift to hear someone speak authentically and talk to another person of interest that might interest you you know, to hear your favorite athlete or your favorite rock star or comedian just sit down and bullshit with someone for a couple hours is so refreshing. And it's never gotten old for me. Podcasting and listening to podcasts is still one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, I think they're just getting started too. Me too. No, me too. Um, we are rolling along here. We got, we got some time on the clock. Let's start winding down a nice cool. smooth, smooth landing, as they say. Sure. Um, what's a quick uh, kind of ex- explanation of what URM does? So URM on let's the the elevator pitch is uh, the world's best and biggest online school for rock and metal producers. That's that's the sentence. That's what it is. Right. Um, if you want to go a little deeper, uh, it is a multifaceted approach towards uh, getting actually good at production in a very real world sort of way. So as opposed to, say, a traditional school, which focuses on lots of ancient techniques and quote unquote proper ways to do things, we cover some of that stuff, but we more cover what's working and what people need to do to actually get ahead. So, and all our instructors are people who make actual records. So it's by real producers for real producers. And it's meant to replace that mentorship aspect that's kind of lost now that big studios are almost completely a thing of the past. Right. Because back in the day, to be an intern at a a studio house meant something. You know, you're the guy that took out the trash and you engineered and you you paid your dues until one day you could be a house engineer. And then eventually you get to produce Bruce Springsteen, right? That's Jimmy Iovine's story back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. No. And so they're going to, people, the next generation is going to need to get the info on how to do this somewhere. And yeah. That's what, that's what we are. Um, and we're in it, not just for the info we're in it for the, for the community and the potential that that brings to not just our students, but our guests also. So we're basically, you know, so there is that, that sales pitch sentence that I gave you, but we're also trying to elevate the production community as a whole. We're trying to help our guests, uh, get more known uh, because I feel like a lot of them are incredible, but just not known enough. Uh, So we're trying to kind of turn producers into rock stars, I guess, Um, because I, I heard and I felt the fear of oversaturation, you know, like how am I going to stand out is a big question as a producer. So we like to be a platform that helps producers stand out, helps give them a voice in a world where all your clients are also producers, right? So it's every single band now has a producer in the ranks. Yes. So why would they choose an outside producer over the dude in the band that's got pro tools? Well, it's because the producer that they're going to hire brings so much more to the table, but, if there's, if everybody's a producer, it's that much harder 
for individual producers to get known. So we're trying to help with that too. So trying to help people get better, but we're also trying to help people who should be known, get known. And then we're also trying to facilitate uh, people's careers, uh, yeah. meaning we're trying to help land our best students with gigs and give them the tools necessary for an actual career in music. So it's a pretty comprehensive thing. No, it's um, awesome. It's an actual community. Yeah, it's an actual community. Several thousands, uh, about about five to 6,000 active, about 50,000 total. Um, and we've got programs ranging from super beginner level stuff to the most advanced shit you've ever seen. Um, it does focus on rock and metal mainly, but the skills are transferable across. And, uh, and we've got a podcast too, the URM podcast. Um, mm -hmm. which I talk to lots of our guests on there as well as other fascinating people. Just so sounds like uh, my guys are going to be on it. Hopefully I can come yes. on. That'd be great. Yeah, for sure. Um, the only other thing I'll say about URM is uh, if you haven't heard of URM, maybe you've heard of Nail the Mix. Nail the Mix is our uh, most popular program. Um, that's where we bring on a different producer each month uh, to show, well, a different mixer each month to show how they mixed an actual song by an actual band that was actually released. We also give our students the raw multi-tracks that we license for the labels and the bands. So, cool. um, so they get the actual session. Mm -hmm. Not, we're not giving them the mixers session with all the plugins in it, but we're giving them the same starting point, the same yeah. raw tracks. Raw tracks. I mean, yeah. dude, that, that alone is like that. That's such a huge service that you're offering. Cause that's really hard to find, you know, like where can I practice this? If I'm, if I'm not getting even people that are allowing me to do free test mixes, like, you know, how, how do I practice this thing? Yeah, we, we have that solved. Now the thing is that, uh, you know as well as I that uh, very few people are ever going to get to record a band like Opeth. Right. Uh, and so if you're, if you're just starting out and you join Nail the Mix, you get Opeth stems, uh, multi-tracks. That's kind of unrealistic. Mm -hmm. uh, you're probably not going to encounter bands that good very often. So we also have a lot of more real world stuff in there. So we have practice tracks that are realistic to, to what you'll actually encounter. So, you know, there's both, you get to see both what's going on at the highest levels, but then also you can learn from stuff that's realistic to whatever level you're at. No, it's awesome, man. It's so cool. And, you know, I think we have a lot of similarities in our goals. Yours is more of a, you know, pass the knowledge down to the next uh, generation sort of thing. And the community aspect is so cool. But the goal of making producers stand out and being of more value in a world where, like you said, everyone's a goddamn producer now, or at least they think they are. Just because you have MacBook Pro and Pro Tools doesn't mean you're a qualified producer. Doesn't mean you're a qualified mix engineer. But everyone thinks they are. So it's really tough to like you said, like why hire an outside guy? And those, those are the things that I'm constantly working on with Stayside. It's always a challenge, but we're always pushing and uh, trying to stand out. So I think to everyone listening, there are communities out there for you. There, I mean, the Stateside community is a real thing. There's a lot of artists we've worked with. There's a lot of producers that we work with. They're more than happy to chit chat with you and share their knowledge of, you know, if you reach out appropriately, like we said, um, but they are very approachable and I am as well. And so is the URM community. Um, I can say from firsthand that going to one of the URM summits was really eye opening and a very positive experience. You guys do a ton of, I mean, God, there's like classes all day, speakers, the biggest producers and mix engineers in the industry talking and even like producer managers were there talking, which I thought was really cool. Johnny Minardi was there. And yeah. really cool. And, and then on top of that, there was a lot of like break off sessions. People go and have lunch with each other. There was coffee corners over here, people at the bar. And there's just so much uh, development and networking 
for a type of person that typically is a lone wolf, <laughs> that is typically in a dark room all day. I mean, this whole quarantine thing is so funny because it's like, yep, producers, producers and mix engineers, this is what they do anyway. Yeah, I'll just keep doing what I always do. Uh, just keep doing what you always do, exactly. Um, but yeah, well, there, but there is a community for everyone. What you're saying, uh, by the way, about the summit, um, the summit is kind of like a microcosm of URM as a whole. Yep. But what you saw there with everything from beginners, from fucking the middle of Iowa, all the way to the biggest producer managers and biggest producers all there hanging out. Nobody's above anybody. No. That's uh, when I said we're trying to facilitate the careers of students and stuff. That's part of it. We're giving them the opportunity to network with people that they will never get an opportunity to network with probably yeah. outside of that, at least in one felt swoop. Dude, uh, and, 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 cool. and you, can, you can attest to this too because you're similar age where there's a misconception that you know, the more we develop in technology and the further we go with social media, the less it's needed to be face to face with people and, and go to these summits and go to these events. And that's just not true. I mean, I can tell you that going to NAM, actually physically being there is so beneficial. I mean, it was just massively beneficial. You get to meet up and do podcasts with folks. You get to be invited to be on podcasts. You get to shake hands. You, you know, you get a bunch of free shit. <laughs> um, and so anyway, I walked out of there with hundreds of business cards, hundreds of contacts, landed a bunch of product ambassadorships for the guys I manage. They're all fucking stoked about it. Everyone gets free compressors. Free compressor for you. Free compressor for you. It's like Oprah. And if I didn't get on an airplane and physically go there, I wouldn't have had all of that. Um, so as much as there is an online community and as much as um, you can network with people without having to be there, I still want to encourage people to physically go to these places and physically meet up with people as much as you can. After the quarantine, of course. After the quarantine, yeah. yeah. There's Social no substitute. <laughs> I mean, there's no substitute for a human connection. And uh, there's a reason for why even in this day and age, people fly for business meetings, you know? Yep. Absolutely, man. Hey, I'm uh, I'm due for a phone call in about 10 minutes here that I I have to make. So I should probably let you go. Uh, Where can people find you on the social medias? On the social medias, you should find me on Instagram and that's at A-L Levy URM audio. I'll spell it out at E-Y-A-L-L-E-V-I U-R-M A-U-D-I-O at A-L Levy URM audio. Or if you want to hear my podcast, just type Unstoppable Recording Machine Podcast into any of the podcast uh, platforms. Or if you want to find out about URM Nail the Mix, just go to urm.academy, no.com. Love it. Love it, man. And I'll, and I'll put all that stuff in the show notes so people can hyperlink it and click to it. Um, anything else Thank people you. should know about? Stay safe. Stay, stay healthy. Yes. In, in, the, in the words of my doctor, the shit is real. The shit is real. Wash your hands. Avoid yeah. being up with people at all costs. I mean, if you can work from home, do that. If you can do anything from home, do that. And, uh, Let's take this shit seriously because we will get through it, but it's going to require all of us to do it together. Yep. All right. Well, thanks again, man. That's super. Well, thank you. Fun.